the invite today. Um, I'm in the central time zone, but I don't think there's anything else I'd rather be doing at 8 a.m. than speaking to all of you. As Dave said, it's, it's not, he wasn't being sarcastic. I really am enthusiastic about figuring out how data can serve youth soccer. As I'll get into shortly, um, I've been using data and analytics to inform strategy and performance in the corporate world. It's, it's found, it's proven to be successful there. And we're hoping to find a way to help you soccer do it as well, but with the benefit being not necessarily profits, but the, the enjoyment and the life skills within the kids, the coaches, and the families uh, that we all care about serving. So that's my interest in this. And Dave, if you're good, should I jump in to the presentation and get started? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. So I want to start by directing this question to all of you. It's my understanding I'm speaking to club presidents, directors of coaching, um, people making influential decisions at your clubs. So these questions, I believe, will be relevant to you. And I'm not going to get into describing these questions or talking too much. I just want you to ponder them for a second before we jump into the presentation, and we'll come back to them at the end. So number one, what outcomes are most important to you as a club? What does is, what is your club exist to create? Might be another way to think of that. It's probably several things, but what is most important to you? Based on that, how well are you doing at every level of your organization in regards to those outcomes? And maybe Think of it less in terms of, are you an A, a B, or grading how well you're doing? How well do you know what level of performance you have in each level of your organization? Third, when you do try something new, which I'm sure a lot of all of you are doing at one point or another, always changing, always trying to get better, how quickly do you know whether and how much this new action you've taken is working? And you can probably imagine how not only knowing whether something's working, but to the extent, the extent to which it is or isn't could change how you might want to act in the future. So answering questions like these, especially the last two, the first one's up to you. Data can't, data can't answer what's, what should be most important. But those second two, it can be helpful. And if you feel in reading some of these that maybe your club is lacking in those last two, that's completely normal. If you were a publicly traded company with thousands of employees, I would say you have big problems if you don't have a decent strategy for those two. But in, in youth soccer, and I've been working in youth soccer now for uh, a few years, maybe four years, I think it's extremely uncommon that people have a methodical way to measure their strategies at every level of the organization and to do it in a timely fashion. It's just not something that's been practical. Uh, things, this, that type of ability, when I started in business in 2004, uh, cost millions of dollars, then eventually became hundreds of thousands and tens of thousands, and it's finally becoming attainable um, in other organizations that don't have those kinds of funds. So that's a little bit about uh, our background, but I think since, Probably none of you know who we are and vice versa. I'll take a few moments to give a little introduction. So Satori Soccer is the name of the organization that myself and my colleague, who's not on the call today, his name's also Adam, but he goes by Al to prevent some confusion. We're a 501c3. We are dedicated to character and community through joy, participation, and performance in youth soccer. We genuinely believe through our own experience and through the experience of others that Success in soccer often leads to success in life. And we're excited about that. We believe it matters. This is why we've both left lucrative corporate careers to try to give to kids, families, coaches, uh, and just our communities through soccer. So we exist to serve people just like you. That's our whole reason for existence. This is what we wanna do. Now, you might say looking above, that says nothing about data. Now I've given a little bit of our backgrounds, 
but when you take a look at just some basic bios, it's, you know, we, basically we're two data nerds who love soccer and love people. And so it's a weird combination, but that's how we got here. My colleague Al is skilled at building databases, reporting systems, integrating the two, as well as other um, systems of integration. What that means is just automating things to make stuff that used to be super expensive or really time consuming, more attainable. And my background is more on the strategy, consulting, finance, analytics side. And so the two of those work together pretty well. We both love soccer. In fact, and I'm a lifelong player, a coach. I'm actually leaving right after this meeting to go coach a session. Um, so that helps inform what we do as well. So the, the opportunity that I want to present to you today is what we're calling GROW. It stands for Growth and Retention Opportunity Wisdom. And so GROW, the idea of it is to give you soccer clubs participation analytics to help you increase joy, participation, and performance. I'm guessing that those three things are at least similar or a subcomponent maybe of what your objectives are as well. And we think that the product that I'm gonna show you has many benefits, but the four biggest ones, the four ones that I think are easiest to explain are at leadership, club staff, coaches, and the player levels. So at the leadership levels, the idea is if you can measure success, then you can manage to it. And think about not only measure success for the club overall, but what if you could do it for every team? And if you can do it for every team, you can do it for every age group, program, or any subset of those things that some staff member on your team, whether they're an admin, a DOC, or whatever their role is, you could subset so that you're measuring their success. By measuring it, you can manage to it. And naturally, something that you manage to, you tend to get better. Just like on the field, if we take time to teach players um, build out patterns to more successfully get into the attacking third or get out of our own half, the more likely we are to get there. It's the same thing, but just used from a, a data and business standpoint. And that's essentially what this gets to. We don't need to read all the words. For club staff, I think it can be as simple as the more you know about your teams who have coaches. So by knowing about your teams, you get insight into your coaches. Having more insight might help us to develop them better. The better our coaches, the better our program. And without reading all the words, a variety of things you can do with more insight on your coaches is of course, develop them better. Uh, intentional placement of which coaches might be best for which teams, knowing the different cultures of different teams or the different challenges within those teams. Who are the types of coaches you may want to look for in the market? What kind of coaches do you want more of? Maybe it influences your hiring practice. Um, by knowing which coaches are being most successful in which areas, Maybe you have an idea of who to gather best practices from and share. So it's no longer uh, a gut feel of what might be best, but you have your gut feel plus data, which I think is always stronger than just either one of those by themselves. At the coach level, you can kind of infer from the previous one, the more a coach knows what their strengths and weaknesses are and getting quicker feedback, the more they're able to grow themselves as they get stronger their team gets stronger, the kids get stronger, the more teams get stronger, the stronger the club gets, et cetera. And finally, almost merely by the success of the things I listed above, all of those things can contribute to players just being happier, being more excited, loving their team, their club, the game more. When they do those things, all else being equal, I think that most, if not all of us would agree an engaged, excited player, it just brings out more. They play better. And when they love the game and they're playing better, the likelihood of them continuing to play grows. So these are the benefits that I think you'll be able to see if I do my job correctly today in uh, the product that we've built for you soccer clubs. So with that, I'm gonna jump over to the actual tool 
So this is an analytics tool that's a cloud tool, which means you would have a login on a website and you would have access to this tool. So this is exactly what the current version of what a club who signs up would have access to. And I'll get into how you get to this because as I show you it, you might say, this is pretty sophisticated. It does a lot of different things. I must need to do a lot of work in order to make this possible. You know, the club would have to do a lot of work. And the answer fortunately is actually no. All that's required is the same registration data that's already coming to Indiana Soccer. We um, extract that from them. Of course, all this with the proper legal requirements around data usage. Again, we'll get to that later. But by merely having that data of who are your players, what teams are they on, who are their coaches, who's their parent, what's their parent email address, a couple of these basic things, everything that I'm gonna show you is created basically automatically or is created without you having to do any of it. You just get a user login, go in and you can see your results. So this first page is simply just participation. So this is a make-believe club, I call it example FC, totally fake data. You'll see some weird patterns in here. So just telling you that in advance. So here's our club. In this case, it's called Valencia. We can see we have 873 players. Here's our number of players by birth year, players by play level, competitive, recreational, intermediate, players by gender. One of the benefits of using an analytics tool like this rather than just getting a PDF report or something or, or using Excel is how interactive it is. Let's say that I wanna see players by birth year, but I wanna know the difference between female and male. And the whole workbook that I'm gonna show you functions like this. You can filter on the page and it changes what you see. So I don't wanna overcomplicate you with all the ways that might be used, but you can imagine you could get hundreds of pages worth of PDF things and just a few pages of reports because they can be customized for whatever question you're trying to solve, or at least a lot of questions. So there's the current participation, which is this summary page. You would have the ability to track participation over time compared to previous seasons. Maybe you want to look at so we're filtered just for rec already, but maybe we wanna look at all of our different programs, rec, competitive, intermediate is what I'm labeling that nine to 10, nine U, 10 U travel program by gender, maybe also by age as well. Over time, how are we doing in these, you know, seven U, eight U, nine U, et cetera. Now I might look at something like my recreational numbers dropping here, my competitive going up. I wonder why the rec is dropping. The ability to filter in and see where are the gaps compared to previous seasons. Specifically, maybe we want to look at spring 2020, which would have been right before it. And we can see there's a big gap here at 5U, 4U, little gaps at 7U, 8U. So I can narrow down very quickly into where some of the drivers are possibly of those differences, which gets me sooner to the important questions of finding out how do I fix it. You can also look at something that's been studied recently around the world. And I think a lot of us are aware of how real it is, relative age effect. Because this is fake data, you don't see the relative age effect in here. But I can confirm, because we, we have another client that we've built uh, this functionality with, Rapids Youth Soccer Club in Colorado. They're about a 9,000 player club. They're so large because they have five regions. So they're basically like five separate clubs. Um, and I can confirm relative age effect is a real thing. Even when people are actively manage it, it's a real thing. And so this would enable you to see where that's most prominent. Is it most prominent in your more competitive teams? Chances are probably yes, but you don't know till you see it. How about with your younger ages compared to your older ages? How is turnover rate different by different birth quarters based on those different breakouts? Again, your, your most competitive younger players, et cetera. This is fake data, so it's actually backwards, but you'll probably find Q4s have a higher turnover rate than previous quarters, which is eye-opening because I don't think any of us want that. And so by knowing it, maybe you can start to think of ideas on how to make it better. 
Adam, you might take just a minute if you would. I'm not sure everyone is is familiar with the term relative age effect. I know okay. those in the coaching side do, but we also have administrators who may or may not know. So you might just take a minute so they can see how relevant this would be to their Perfect. club. Yep. So given that players are bucketed into years based on the calendar year now from, from January 1st through December 31st, younger players, so players, let's say born October, November, December, those would be Q4 birth dates, have a natural disadvantage, uh, you know, just physiologically to players born in the first three months. And it makes common sense, but not until I think the last five, maybe 10 years or so, have people been starting to study how prominent that actually is. There's books written on it, there's academic studies written on it, and they're finding that older children, imagine a, a, ten, a nine-year-old who's 10 months older than another player on their same team. They've been developing physically and mentally for 10% longer on earth than the other kid. They're naturally gonna be far beyond. They might not be any more genetically or motivationally superior. In fact, they may be slightly inferior in those things. That younger kid, if they had 10 months to catch up and this other kid had to stay static, they might pass them. But it doesn't work that way because we're, we're naturally trying to field, field a competitive team, put kids together of similar abilities. And those, old, those younger birth quarters sometimes aren't as involved accidentally as we would like them to be. And if their experiences aren't as fruitful as some of the younger players, we might find that they're not getting the same opportunities that maybe it seems like we would want them to have. As such, they may be playing on lower teams and losing some of their motivation than they might have otherwise had they had the same opportunity or leaving youth soccer at a faster rate than they otherwise would, something I know none of us want to see happen. And so the fact that we can measure now that those are occurring, those instances, you know, maybe it helps us more proactively find solutions. I don't think anybody in the world has phenomenal solutions yet. There's a lot of theories out there, but maybe this is the basis to start to measure what can work the best. Another thing that you'll have access to that I think is essential is growth and turnover. So new players coming into the club and your ability to retain players or limit turnover from them leaving. On all of these charts, just to give you a quick interpretation. Now I'm not gonna explain everything because we don't have the time to explain every chart, but I think it's important to mention the difference between this circle and this triangle. So the orange circle is the percentage of turnover. So in this case, if I hover over it, 52% turnover, again, fake data. So the numbers are a little bit wonky and 50% new players. So because the, the circle is higher than the triangle, we know that our turnover is slightly higher than our new player growth, which means our club is declining. Now I can look at, now not fast, but we have dropped a little bit since the last season. I can look at it by gender, by birth year, or I can sort, oh, this is recreational. It's already sorted. Um, so maybe I look at my club overall, which actually was growing, but when I sorted by recreational, I could see that it was shrinking. There's a variety of ways, and I'll come back to this again later to show how this might be used in some really valuable ways. Um, so I'll kind of leave you with that for a moment. <clears throat> the next two charts leverage registration data and census data. So we know through the census, which is being refreshed soon, so this, this analysis will get more accurate soon, we know estimates of how many children ages five to 17 live in every census tract in the United States. And since we know the home addresses of players, we know what census tract they're in. We're not mailing them anything. We're not going to visit them. We just wanna know what census tract they're in so we can compare. In this case, here is, and I like to go to the next one, which is very similar, but I think an even more valuable analysis, market penetration. Market penetration is the percentage of kids in a census tract that play at your club. And so that's what this, again, it's fake data, but I think it still looks similar to what you would see. The size of the circle 
shows the, the, the magnitude of that penetration rate. So what percentage of, of kids in that census tract play at your club? So in this case, I hover over it, I can see market penetration of 3.5%. I know with some work we've done with others, this rate can be a lot higher in places where you're really in the neighborhoods getting people involved. But this is a simple way to track that. Where are your players coming from? Where are you finding the greatest uh, access? And it's also, you'll notice, it's leveraging another factor. The color of these census tracts indicates median family income. So the ability to pay for traditional club soccer. The darker colors, higher incomes, the lighter colors lower, the green the lowest. I think these are valuable for two reasons. One, let's say this is my club and I'm headquartered somewhere over by this golf course. I look at some of these higher income neighborhoods and I say, wow, they're so close to us. Why are so few kids playing here? Is there something else that can be done to remedy that? Or maybe I look at some of these other neighborhoods that might not be able to afford my current product, but I say they're so close is there a different product I can create that's more affordable and or can I use this information to apply for grant funding to show what my target is, uh, convincing information about why there's almost certainly kids there that would like to play. And by having this capability, I can measure our progress over time, which I think is something that's favorable to foundations uh, and other organizations offering grant funding. So there's some possibilities there as well. Before you leave this one, Adam, I would like to just jump in and say, to, to me, this is, this is worthy of a lot of conversation. When you look at where your club is located and you look at the penetration rate, keep in mind on a national basis, we're serving as the youth, all youth clubs combined. We're serving less than 5% of the kids who are age appropriate to play in our clubs from five to 19 years old. Less than 5%, it's around four or something, four and a half. That means 95% of the kids aren't and are available to be playing in our clubs. So when we look at this type of data, you can begin to see what our penetration rate is. And I'm glad that, that Adam uses that term. Are we getting 15% in this area? Well, maybe that's good for that area. But we may only be we may get 25% in one area, but that's bad when you start looking at the opportunity. So it gives a, the administrative side of our clubs an opportunity to really look at and analyze where are kids coming from, what demographic group are they in, what are their resources, and also appreciated uh, Adam's comments. We offer a certain product, and we offer the same product to every kid at every age group. Uh, but should we be bifurcating that? Should we be offering different uh, levels of play? And if we go into a really low end income side that can't afford travel soccer, for example, what do we do to those? What do we do in those areas to make sure that those kids have an opportunity to play? Someone needs to provide that service and I can't think of anybody better than us. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, yeah, excellent points, completely agree. So that is, I would call it one half of the service. This is purely using registration data, census data, and various calculations and tools to visualize um, this information. The second part of it, which I think is just as important, possibly more important, I think that that's still up for debate, but the Rapid Juice Soccer Club would consider the second part, maybe even more important, is once we've seen our registration, we know where our players are, we know where we're looking to grow, how well we're doing in retention, which of course is paramount, or at least, you know, very important. Why? Why are we doing so well in one area and not somewhere else? Why is one division or one age group or this team, that team doing better and, and not another one? To take that first step towards why using data, the, the, the place that I think makes sense to start is with a simple but precise postseason parent survey. So the purpose of this is to ask your membership at the end of the season in a confidential way, meaning that their responses are protected. So this is one of the benefits of a third party. We can conduct the survey so that our database knows who said what, 
so we can provide uh, deeper research and find find larger insights for the benefit of all of us. But the club themselves doesn't know who responded or who said what, but you would know how many responded, not only overall, but for each team and the average scores of the questions and the comments that were submitted by team. It just doesn't have a name associated with it. So it's a way to protect that anonymity and parents feel free to say, uh, you know, be, be honest about their experience. Most of the time, well, there's a few different things I would say about that. Before I jump in, one of the things I wanna mention that's really, really important about this, we've, I've met some clubs that had, have done some surveys, but the response rates are five, 10, 15%. The problem with response rates that low, can you trust that that's a reflection of your club? Can you trust that if you have a team of 15 players and three responded, is that an accurate reflection of what it's like to be on that team? In my experience, it's not, unfortunately, because we know that when just a small number of people reply, it's usually either the ones that are most upset or the ones that are most excited or people that just believe feedback is really, really important and they do it every time uh, somebody asks for it. But what we want is, almost everybody, or at least a representative sample replying so that we can be confident in what the data tells us. To do that, we need much higher response rates. Uh, in this example, and I'll filter back to the whole club, the response rate is 46%. Uh, with Rapids, we're getting a similar number to that, and it's getting higher each season. There is a process. I've worked with a couple companies with, that do annual employee surveys where they don't know who responded, they don't know who said what, and they get more than 90% response rate. There is a playbook for how to get extremely high response rates. I don't have time to get into it, but it's a clear playbook. Uh, Rapids response rates have grown from the 20s into about 50, and they're going up. There's clear things you can do over time that show parents their data is confidential. You are reading it, you are learning from it, and you're making changes as a result at every level of the organization, uh, which is not only good for the organization, but it increases response rate, which then further increases the quality of the feedback you get, which increases your ability to make positive change, et cetera. So you get this feedback loop uh, that's beneficial for everybody. Now, this report, a few critical elements, and I would say the most important is probably this big score at the top. Net promoter score, is a metric that's calculated across industries. It is a benchmarked metric that you could find any Fortune 500 company conducts these things with their members, their customers, et cetera. So it's a standardized question across all industries. And the idea is that it measures how satisfied your customer or your member is in your service. Now I'm gonna jump back over to my presentation to explain it a little bit further. It's so important that I think it's worth making sure we're all aware of what this calculation is. So it asks them a question, the parent, on a scale from zero to 10, it's actually zero, although I forgot to put the zero on here. How likely are you to recommend club ABC to a friend or colleague? People that score a nine or a 10 are considered promoters. They found these are people that are out there singing your praises. They love to tell people how great you are. People of seven or eight, they like your product. They're probably gonna continue, but they're not, they're not excited to throw it out there. They're happy to, to say how they feel when people ask, but they're, they're probably not actively promoting. And then folks between a zero and a six are considered detractors. Even though there's a big difference between let's say a two and a six, even a six, when somebody says, how's that club? Ah, it's all right. It's pretty good. That's not exactly a ringing endorsement. And so what a net promoter score is, is it takes the percentage of your promoters minus the percentage of your detractors and gives you a score that's somewhere between negative 100 and 100. And so it's one of the most, if not the most common way that companies track the improvements in customer satisfaction. On this survey that, uh, that we provide, there's also 
a small number of other questions that we ask that start to get to the meat of why. So why that net promoter score? Let's say the promoter score goes up or down. Let's get that first layer, peel off one layer of the onion, what might be driving it? So some of the things that will, there's only four things actually we ask, because we think it's important to have a simple, easy to complete survey to get parents uh, engaged rather than a 20, 30 question survey that takes them an hour. This can be five minutes or less. We want to know um, on a Likert consistent scale, just one of those one to five question scales, strongly disagree to strongly agree. My player enjoyed their overall experience this season. My player improved as a soccer player. Question about the coach's communication and a question about the communication from all non-head coach staff at the club. We also give parents a chance to provide optional comments. This first one is, what do they think is the largest opportunity for improvement? What was their favorite part of this season's experience? And do they have any other ideas that they think might be helpful? Now, if any of you get this kind of a little bit of a nervous feeling of, ah, it, like it could be dangerous to have this information because then parents might hold you accountable to it. There is some truth to that, but I think it's also true that parents understand you can't get to everything. So even though there was that fear, not fear, but um, question mark with Rapids Youth, are we opening up Pandora's box in a way that could be negative by pulling all this information? And even when we're telling them, we can't do it all, but we wanna hear what you have to say. And we're gonna try to get better each season based on what you tell us. What if it still will drag you down? Well, in the business world that I haven't seen that to be true. And even in youth soccer, Rapid Youth Soccer has consistently been climbing their net promoter scores while doing these things. So I don't think that they're adversely impacting and there's probably a better case to be made that they're helping, of course, that progression. So let me show you the rest of what's in here before I go back to the presentation. So you can see for the club overall, what is my net promoter score? We talked about promoters, passives, and detractors. Maybe I wanna look at it across my different play levels. Maybe I wanna see um, the net promoter score for rec, intermediate, and competitive over the different ages so I can see how that progresses. And I wanna start looking into the underlying components, enjoyment, improvement, and communication. By the way, we also conduct correlations between net promoter score and these questions. Correlation meaning how does the change in one thing, so let's say player enjoyment, as player enjoyment goes up, does that tend to happen with a higher net promoter score as well? So does player enjoyment going up tend to also coincide with net promoter score going up? If so, that's a high correlation. The highest correlation of everything we've studied at Rapids, for example, um, I can't give you specific numbers because that would be breaking confidentiality, but it, I can tell you that the highest correlation among 50 factors we tested was player enjoyment. Player enjoyment was more highly correlated with net promoter score than anything else, including a variety of things to do with player evaluations, game recaps, player movement, et cetera. So that is an interesting insight in itself. Now, Adam, Adam yeah. with, that, with that being said, um, is there a correlation or have you been able to track correlation between the retention of players, which would add to the growth of the club, as to your net promoter score increase and your player enjoyment increase? Great question. So that is what we are going to test this spring. So for reasons I don't want to get into here, you need, you need to collect data in the right way and have the right amount of it. Um, to do that. And so we're doing it with Rapids for the first time this spring in a comprehensive study. So we, yeah, we will have uh, more data on the connection between net promoter score and retention, the connection between retention and all of these things that the parents are sharing about their experience and the 50 other factors that I mentioned, seeing how, how important are those in retention. The reason we hadn't done them in the past, and it also combines with the reason why a third party is so important. If the club themselves conducts this survey, you almost need it to be anonymous so parents will be honest with their experience. Once it's anonymous, you can't connect 
their choice to keep playing or to leave to any of their confidential scores. They're disconnected forever. And so you can't do that research. By having a third party, our database has that data. I don't care to look at it. We're prevented legally from ever sharing anything to do with any of that. Um, but the data can look at that. It masks all the names and player IDs and all these things. But it means that the correlations, the statistical analysis, you know, that us nerds get excited about, uh, can be done at a higher level, more advanced. And then ultimately, we share that knowledge with you. We don't say which player is which, but we can tell you wh what's most highly correlated with retention. So hopefully, Dave, that gets at what you're talking about a little bit. Thank, thank you. Yeah. The next page. So if we can do this, go here for a second. If we can do this for the club out overall, net promoter score, survey questions, and we could drill into maybe specific genders or play levels. We also have this data. The reason that we can summarize it at any level we want is because we have it at the team level. We actually have it at the player level, but we only share it with clubs at the team level again to protect confidentiality of the parents. So here would be an example of every team in the club. Maybe I just pick competitive and it's already sorted by net promoter score. So I could see in one sheet, every single team sorted by net promoter score top to bottom. Or maybe I wanna see which of my teams have the highest enjoyment or uh, are, which coaches are really excelling in coach communication. Now this data again is random, in real life, you don't see coaches being excellent at one thing and horrendous <laughs> at something else, but take that into consideration. But you can see how well uh, coaches are doing. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot of stuff outside of the coach's control that can change parent satisfaction, 100% true. So we do see that in data. No coach is perfectly consistent in their scores over time. But we've also noticed that there is a high correlation some coaches are consistently, coaches with maybe one or two outliers here are consistently kind of in a range. So some coaches consistently have happy teams no matter the results on those teams. Some are consistently struggling, some are all over the board. Uh, and when you get to meet some of these folks, you start seeing similar profiles of people in those different buckets. Um, so you can start to imagine how this might give you insights on how to help your coaches get better, what kind of coaches you wanna be looking for, et cetera. Because this is at the team level, we also, and because I think it's proven beneficial to the coach to be able to see this data. Now it can crack our ego a little bit to see our imperfections. Um, Cause I'll tell you in four seasons of doing a survey like this with, with Rapids, and this isn't, this again, isn't private data. There's never been a perfect score. Perfect score, meaning they get fives on everything. They get perfect 10 net promoter score on every submission and they have a response rate over 50%. So we can be confident in the quality uh, of, the, of the responses. There's never been perfect, which I think is actually liberating. It reminds us that we can't be perfect. Really, really good coaches usually have at least one or two parents that aren't happy. And that, that's nice to know that that's normal across hundreds of teams. There's no such thing as perfect, which also means that everybody can get better. So a page like this, maybe for Coach Joseph with the Water Buffaloes, a competitive female team, random data again, a little scrambly, but we could print this out, print a PDF, share it with Coach Joseph. So the conversation a DOC might have with Joseph anyway now can also be founded in data to help identify strengths, weaknesses, and an overview of their season. And by the way, we can also pull in game results, in this case from Indiana uh, leagues and tournaments to show that team's game results as well. So that would automatically be populated in there. And then finally, as parents give comments by team, we could pull those comments up. Let's say if I just wanted to Look at comments people are making about player enjoyment or, oh, I need to move this presentation a little bit. I can filter, let's say that I'm really interested in, oh, 
I don't have it on that page. It'll be in there in the end, but maybe I want to filter out just for what was the single biggest improvement idea that parents had. I could filter for just that. And not only for the club overall, but I could choose the specific play level and gender, age group, what have you, so that maybe that DOC has the information they need to start thinking about what they're gonna do better. So that, that's the tool. Now I wanna flip back to the presentation and do a real quick double check on questions. Anything so far? Nothing yet, Dan. Okay. So I'm gonna put on my club president and director of coaching hat and imagine that I'm operating example FC. So given that I've had a chance, you know, you guys have had a chance to see this for, what is it, 40 minutes. Uh, I've been working on this for a few years. And so how might, how have I seen clubs use this successfully? How might I want to use it to get the most out of it? Now there's a lot of things you can do. Maybe your wheels are already turning based on what you've seen, but I want to show just four things that I think are really important to a lot of clubs that can be benefited by grow this system. So let's say my example FC club, objective number one, I wanna create outstanding youth soccer experiences. S brings me back to that idea, success in, locker, success in soccer equals success in life. Maybe that's one of our mottos. So can I, and the answer of course is yes, uh, intentionally grow enjoyment in all areas of the club. If I want kids to love playing here and knowing how highly correlated enjoyment is with net promoter score, and I'm sure we'll find it to be true with re retention as well, can I intentionally grow in all areas of the club? So an example of how I might do that, I come back to this net promoter score postseason parent summary page. Maybe I have three directors in my club who help uh, administer this club. Maybe I have a competitive girls DOC. So this is her report. This is her net promoter score target. Here's where sh her starting point is. Um, here's the overall enjoyment, improvement, and communication metrics in her world that she's accountable for. She can use this then to measure her improvements over time and to set that bar. One of our benefits in youth soccer club is we have some very competitive people, right? We love to compete, we love to play. There's a lot of those folks in the game. Let's use that to our advantage. When we start keeping score, I think it can unlock uh, more of our, our motivation and our creativity, just like it might on the field. I can, the same thing for the boys competitive director. And then maybe I have a recreational DOC and here's her page. So everybody can see, and we're managing, in this case, let's talk about enjoyment. They can see their enjoyment here uh, at every level of the club. And if they want to dive in deeper, they could look at specific teams, let's say for recreational males, where are people really having fun? And I go out and I talk to Burton, Jana, Elisa, Glenna. You guys are doing amazing. What are you doing that you think might be different? And how can I, how can I share that with some of the other folks? Because maybe these are parent volunteer rec coaches. They might be ecstatic to hear these ideas. So that's, that's, an, that's just one way that you could intentionally grow enjoyment faster and with more precision than without data. Number two, maybe I want to increase membership. I've looked at my market penetration page and it's clear there's a ton of kids out there that aren't playing soccer that might be benefited by either giving it a try and when people try it, keeping them engaged. So how can we actively manage new player growth and retention? One way, and there's many ways to look at this, including that uh, market penetration page, but we could just start with growth and, uh, growth and turnover page. So here, move my window a little bit. Maybe I'm looking at the club as a whole. And I see, how do I grow my club? I have two levers. I have growth, which is the triangle, and turnover, which is the circle. Both of them can be improved. I want to lower my turnover. I want to increase my growth. And so I'm trying to figure out, I didn't change much from last season. I want to figure out why. And I scroll over. Maybe I look at the different age groups. 
I can see turnover was a lot higher for 2012s. Maybe that's right when they go into 77. I lost some players for some reason. Things, of course, get a little crazy with high school players. They may be going in and out of high school or club. Um, and so I can, I can start to analyze it there. Or maybe I see, look, my male and female are drastically different. Why, why is female growth so much higher and this is lower? What is it about the, the, the male group that's so different? So maybe I click on that and I see the male version and I could toggle back and forth the difference between male and female. And I could be looking at each of these, each of these birth years individually within my different programs individually. We're not gonna do it right now on the phone, but you can see how easy it would be to find where are your biggest gaps? Where are things most different? And maybe the first thing that helps me do is, all right, wh who should I be going talking to? Are they doing something special there? If it's something that's being done really well on the girl's side. Conversely, is there something that's happening on the boy's side that we can remedy? Either through pr policy, process, people, something we can do to make that better. So that is an example, let me check time, okay. That's an example of how we might increase membership. Another one, since the coach in some ways is the club to players and families, they know there's other people involved as well, but the vast majority of their experience comes from that coach. We want an exceptional coaching staff at Example FC. And so I wanna help each, close, each coach get as close as they can to their potential. Not only their potential to understand the game and to teach the coaching points, but also just their motivation and passion for mentoring kids through the game and their love of the game and teaching the details that come along with it. So I've touched on this before, but the first place that I would go to for that, although it's not the only place, would be a specific, a specific team page for that coach. So we'll go back to our, our good friend, imaginary Joseph Grimes. Um, the DOC may already, let's make, in my example FC, coach development is so important. The DOC has already meet at least once a season, uh, not in person during COVID, but let's say in person to go over uh, what, what, are, what are their plans for the season? What are their goals as a coach? What do they think are their strengths and weaknesses? What does the data have to say about that? Not that the data is always right, but it's something worth considering. And from there, we can start to talk about what are their goals going forward? How might they get there? And we have this to help understand our improvement over time in those areas. So rather than needing to wait many seasons and then again, only having a gut feel of, did we actually get better? Did my uh, communication with parents actually improve? By measuring it, we have a faster way to get that feedback than waiting a really long time or having to purely trust our gut. I do believe that gut feels are valuable. It's only when you match them with data though that they become most effective. That's one example how I would use the tool to improve the coaching staff. And finally, we are a soccer club uh, that plays competitive soccer, travel soccer. We wanna succeed on the field to some extent. Everybody has a different opinion on how they might define success or how much, how important that is to them. But let's say my club, we still wanna be successful in the field. And maybe we wanna to try to improve faster than our competition. Now, without even needing go into the tool, imagine if I'm creating wonderful experiences that are increasing kids' engagement, motivation, and passion for the sport. I'm getting a, a slightly higher number of new players to try the game. The players I already have are staying at higher rates because I'm managing that. So I have a larger pool to pull from to develop over time. Hopefully we're doing it at young ages as well. So they're building with us over a long period of time. That's naturally gonna translate of course to higher performance overall for the club. A larger and more talented pool of players all by itself creates new opportunities. Not to mention increasingly effective coaches of course can create increasingly effective players and teams. Now there are things that we could possibly do to measure oh, to measure success through league results, tournament results, 
Those aren't things that's built into this tool yet, but they probably will in the future. It's just a matter of time to develop that. But nonetheless, there's multiple things that would inherently increase success just by managing some of these things that we've seen can be done from above. So we're getting a little short on time, so I'm gonna move quick, but I want you to know this product isn't an untested theoretical concept. It's something that we've been doing with Rapids Youth Soccer for some time, as I mentioned. Here was a testimonial that Aaron um, was kind enough to write for me this week in advance of this uh, meeting, just so that people can see other folks that are thinking similar thoughts to them. He's the executive director at Rapids Youth. What does he think of the product? Uh, I'll let you read this quickly. I'll just expose it on here. So hopefully that's a reflection of what we've been talking about so far, that it's helping them improve experience, development, retention. They're getting to things sooner or possibly even uncovering things that they didn't know uh, existed or was an issue before. Um, yeah, and they're able to make adjustments. Now he's talking about each week so they have, they're kind of at step two of this process, as you will. Step one is what I'm presenting here, seeing your data, getting feedback from parents. Step two is incorporating uh, just more pieces, getting feedback from coaches as well, getting feedback in the preseason, and also getting feedback from teams and coaches uh, about their team's performance and players' performance throughout the season. So I would consider that's kind of step two, but that's just a natural progression on what I'm showing uh, today. Now, how to participate. For those of you that might be interested in this program, for starters, even though this is far less than what would be normal in the business world, um, we of course do have to charge. We're a 501c3, but we're not funded by grants, at least not at this time. Um, so there has to be enough so that my colleague and I can live our humble existence, uh, eat food, pay rent, and continue to do what we love. And so, for clubs, the standard price is a $510 per season. So if there's two seasons per year, it would be twice a year. That gets you up to 500 players. And then an additional 75 cents per player per season after that. Now, because you're fortunate uh, to have a very innovative, uh, unusual um, state association director, I can say that with confidence. I've met about 30 state association directors and I like, I like a lot of them, if not all of them, but you have a very innovative one who's always pushing the envelope and wanting to be on the cutting edge of doing things better. Uh, Dave has, and Dave, if you would jump in, um, offered to front the cost for the first year for any club that wants to try this. And then if you choose to continue after a year for a Indiana nonprofit rate of, of this $170 per season and an extra 25 cents per additional player beyond 500. Yeah, thanks Adam. Uh, I, again, as I showed you beginning, I, I got, I met Adam a couple of years ago. I was fascinated with what he was doing with analytics. It was something that I felt like we've, we've been behind the, the eight ball, uh, so to speak, as a, as a soccer community by not collecting data, not using data, not being purposeful about how we're using data to increase the experience so that we have better retention, serve more kids. Um, so I, I quickly kind of got a hold of that and said, okay, well, let's, let's see what this thing, this tool of yours does. I want each club to have access to it. And we certainly want to remove the, the hurdle of any hurdles that are in the way. So we remove the the cost factor for that first year completely. Indiana soccer is going to shoulder that cost. Really want you to jump on board. If in fact you're interested, I want you to email me, dave at soccerindiana.org. Again, that's dave at soccerindiana.org. I'll put that in the chat uh, thing here in just a second. Uh, and then hopefully you'll, you'll see the value of it. And then again, rather than 75 cents a player, it's only 25 cents a player. As, as being a member of Indiana soccer going forward. And when you look at that figure, uh, first year 510, well, 
that's a player too if you retain your players. So just retaining your players will two or three players will more than pay for uh, the fee if you had to the first year. And then the second year, it's only $170 after the first year. Well, again, that's really no money when you look at your budget. There's lots of other things we could do to make up that shortfall. But I highly encourage you to reach out, uh, see if you want, see if you don't want to implement this piece. It, it came out of the business world and, I, and we learned a long time ago, don't expect what you're not willing to inspect. And basically, this tool allows you to inspect what your expectations are. Right now, we're kind of flying by the seat of our, of our pants. And as Adam said, we have a, an emotion or we have a feeling, a gut feel. But now we can back that up with data and start making some really good decisions based on data and then measure if that decision was the right decision or not. So I highly encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And if it's any indication, Rapids are just one club, but the amount of work that we do for them, it started small and they just keep asking for more and more and more, um, offering more and more um, compensation for the product. So I, I feel like it is working in youth soccer and, and the time is perfect for any other club that wants to be on the front edge of using this to their advantage, to the advantage of their players, families, uh, and community. Now, how does this actually work? There's only a couple minutes left, so I need to move through this. The club submits data to Indiana Soccer, which is what you're doing already. This adds to the importance of, if you wanna participate, of fully accurate data, having it really be precise, that once your registration records are complete, that it's reflected accurately in Indiana Soccer's data, garbage in, garbage out when it comes to data. If you want great outputs, quality analysis, you need to make sure we have quality data. We pull that data and or Indiana Soccer sends it to us so we can process it, run all the calculations. Most of our process is automated, which is why we can offer such low fees. Otherwise, if we were manually cranking out several hours per club, we could never do this. Um, this is why it wasn't possible until technology expanded a little further. Uh, and then we provide confidential analysis to the club and to the state. So the only people that would see your club data is you and the state association trying to help you. And there'd be legal agreements in place to prevent that private information going any further than that. Of course, our database is encrypted and protected in multiple ways. Finally, you might wonder about the survey. We conduct the survey and we'll give you a little playbook of how you can, what you can do to increase response rates. We'll never tell you what you should do with the data, that's up to you, but we can give you advice along the way, a little bit of uh, cons consulting to help you make the most out of it based on what we've seen is successful for others. And so Dave, we're a little tight, so maybe I'll just jump straight to the end. And if there's questions, I'd love to circle back with anybody that has questions, either either personally via, via uh, screen share meeting or a tele, tele, teleconference or email. So- Adam, you yeah. might put up your, if they would, how, how would they contact you if they want to do so? Um, is it, can you, let me throw that in the chat. I'll throw that in the, I'm in presentation window, so I can't see it, but it's adam.coon at satorisoccer.org. I'll throw that in the chat, or maybe there's a way to send it out to him. Is that possible? Yes. Okay, thank you. So finally, to wrap it all up, data-driven decision-making isn't just for big corporations anymore. I think we've made that part clear. It's also clear that the better we measure success, the more of it, can, the more of it we can achieve. Whether that's teaching our kids how to finish crosses, you know, take direct free kicks, or improve net promoter score in our girls' 9U program. Measuring success at every level, at the team level and up, enables everyone to get involved. Coaches, directors, admins, leadership, board. Everybody can see the data that's relevant to what they're responsible to help improve. It increases alignment. It can increase in excitement around a single goal that we all share in making the club better. If we're looking for more clarity on where is value created. I think it's as simple as every single time that we can make a better 
or a faster decision than we would have made without that data, we've created value. So every time the data helps me do something better or even just faster, that means I'm on to the next level compared to the next guy or gal or compared to where I would have been without it. And so finally, if we circle back to that first slide, where we were talking about what are your strategic objectives at a club? Now, those are gonna be unique to you, but hopefully I've shown that no matter what they are, there's a good chance that GROW can help you get there. So I just wanna say thank you to everybody for your time. Certainly wish you the best, hope you have a great day and hope to hear from you. Thanks, Adam. My pleasure.